Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Royal Photographic Society's uh, series of talks from our award recipients. It's my great pleasure this evening to hand over to Joe McDonald, our awards manager, who will introduce this evening's speakers and their who will be in conversation for us. So, Joe, over to you. Welcome to tonight's conversation. Leslie is creative director of Aperture publisher of the Photo Book Review and editor of more than 100 books. Bruno, <clears throat> excuse me, is the founder and director of Self Published Be Happy and a visiting lecturer at École Cantonale d'Art de Lausanne. Both Bruno and Leslie are recipients of the Society's Award for Photographic Publishing. We will open up the public Q&A after the conversation. If you have questions, please put them in Zoom chat. You may also be interested to know that our next in conversation will be between Gideon Mandel on our FRPS and Gareth Evans during the evening of Tuesday the 19th of October. All details are on our website. So over to you, Leslie and Bruno. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's nice to be um, back um, here and um, Welcome to Leslie Martin. Um, can you hear the noise of uh, rain outside? Because if that's the case, I might have to run and close the window. No, okay. Um, hi, Leslie. Hi, Bruno. Nice to see you. Good to see um, you too. I did want to thank the Royal Photographic Society and I did want to show off my exciting medallion of achievement, which um, for an American is very exciting to get something like that. And um, I'm ha really happy to be here in conversation with you, Bruno. Thank you. Another medallion recipient. Another, which I couldn't find, but um, people have to trust that I got one too. <laughs> um, so uh, Leslie and I have known each other for a very long time, um, maybe 20 years, um, possibly around that. And um, uh, we sp spend a lot of time together, we work together in different projects, but I wanted to take this opportunity to learn new things from uh, you. Um, and I'm gonna try to do that uh, using your long experience as a publisher and an editor, and also somebody that's been programming around books. And um, as you've been, as we, going to learn um, involved with publishing for nearly 25 years. Is that correct? Every white hair, every silver hair is another page in a book. I see. Well, 100 books for average or 60 pages, that makes a lot of gray and <laughs> white hair. Um, so I'm going to use a, you, I'm going to use the time 45 minutes to um, ask you questions about how the medium itself has changed in the last 25 years, uh, in its form, in its distribution, but as something that I'm particularly interested in, also the community around it. But before we do that, I think uh, for those that might not be so um, familiar with your work, um, we have a slideshow in which you will go through some of your work. And maybe the first question for you, just to kind of set the tone is, um, how did you start working in photo books? Well, I often uh, say that I am almost entirely a creature of Aperture. I've been Aperture trained and have been working, as you said, uh, for almost, well, 25 years, considering that my first real hands-on experience, if you don't include yearbook or things of that nature, was uh, as an intern at Aperture. And Aperture, for those of you who don't know, is a not-for-profit organization that is currently based in New York, had been started in San Francisco with some stays in Rochester, Boston. But now we're in New York. It has a very uh, long history for an American publication. It was started in 1952. And the cards that I'm showing right now was the announcement of the first issue of Aperture Magazine. And you can see there's sort of a stellar cast of people, um, including Minor White, Nancy Newhall, and Beaumont Newhall, who were historians and curators, 
Oman Newhall, the first curator of photography at, at MoMA, Ansel Adams, Ernest Louis, Dodie Warren, Dorothea Lang, who's also quite well-renowned, Barbara Morgan, who's a very experimental photographer who may not be as well-known, and Milton Ferris. So I was interested very vaguely in the idea of, of photography and photo editing, and I knew Aperture Magazine, and I thought, well, maybe I could be an editor, whatever that means. And I applied for an internship and um, I was placed in the book program and pretty much that opened my eyes to a whole career and really an art form that I hadn't known existed. And as somebody who's always been interested in the idea of how image, images can wield power in the social environment and how context informs the way that we believe or disbelieve an image. Bookmaking was kind of a great way of thinking about how context, the words and the sequence of an image um, put together can really be an important medium unto itself. Um, so you started with an internship and then um, where did you go from there? Well, um, I freelanced. I did do a brief stint. Um, I mean, I assisted photographers. I worked at a place called Graphis. I ended up um, going back to school to try my hand at being a photographer, but found I missed the direct experience of actually getting to know photography by engaging with artists directly on projects they were working on. So I went back to Aperture. Um, I worked for three or four years and then at the time, and I'll advance, and I think this is something that we're going to talk about, but these are the types of books that Aperture was publishing at the time or close had recently published. I mean, these are classics of the of photographic literature, but I could sense that there was a kind of shift in the type of books that could be made. And I felt a little um, that the, the director at the time didn't share those interests. So I moved on, I freelanced with um, another former Aperture editor at a small place called Umbridge Editions. And we started this small publishing house that uh, as small publishing houses often do, wasn't entirely sustainable. And so when that seemed to be closing up shop, I found myself back at Aperture and that was in 2003 and 2004. So um, that did was- it change? Did it change by then? Well, it hadn't changed yet. And again, like these books that we're looking in front uh, here on the slide, you know, Edward Weston was the first book of photography aside from outside of the magazine, but really a, a publication intended as a book um, of a single artist, The Flame of Recognition, Edward Weston, published in 1965 and still in print actually to this day, which I think is kind of remarkable. Classics like Arbus, like um, Nan Golden. And I mean, this format that we're talking about, the Arbus kind of format, which is a very classic, imagine you're in a gallery, imagine there's a white space, a matted frame on the walls in the, in the white cube of a gallery. This was the modus operandi of bookmaking at Aperture. Even when I returned, honestly, so in 2003 and 2004, and I think to sort of set the stage, 2004 is when the photo book, A History, um, Martin Parr's uh, famous publication, following on the heels, I should say, of Horacio Fernandez's Fotografia Publica, just had exploded open the conversation about what a photo book could be, there were, as you know, the beginnings of a strong self-publishing movement and increased communication internationally about what books were being published thanks to the World Wide Web. So I think all of that started to shift what could be possible as a publisher. And I think the first book that really opened my eyes and was both sort of a nod back and a look forward 
was um, I worked very closely with a colleague of mine who had been another intern at the time, but then had left and moved to Japan, Ivan Vartinian, who helped me create a facsimile of a very historic Japanese photo book from the 1960s and 70s called Kamae Tachi by the photographer Eiko Hosoi. And this book, if you've ever seen it, it's not like any other book that I had ever seen. And so I thought the challenge of being able to produce this in a limited edition, which at the time was very novel to Aperture because Aperture had always considered itself a publisher for a wider public audience. But the idea that we could produce 500 copies of this charge, you know, $350, $400 at the time, and really spend a lavish amount of money making it unusual and beautiful was something that kind of was like a light bulb that went off in my head. And thanks to the inspiration in part of a little bit of time spent with Japanese photo books of the 60s and 70s, like this one. And I will say that later down the road, because it seems a shame that this incredible body of work wasn't available to a wider public we did publish it as a more affordably a price, priced trade book. And that's what you see in the corner. So do you remember um, what book did you work first as an editor at Aperture? Oh, you would never know it. I was given a project that was a book of um, poetry and um, a kind of meditative nude self-portraits that was by somebody who I would say was part of the director's network. And it was not a book that I would have chosen myself, but even that was, um, I can't name names, but even that was quite interesting because it showed me that with some lavish attention spent to on design and production, you can make something quite beautiful, even if not maybe notable or let's say, something that's going to change the history of photography. And I, I do think that idea that there are books that can change and impact the history of photography is sort of embedded in the DNA of Aperture and something I, I feel responsible to. Not that every book can do that, but it's just something in the back of my mind. I mean, it's interesting, and I don't want to jump to that, but it seems to me that I, first as an editor and then as a publisher, um, You've been thinking about that, you know, book that further developed the language of um, photo books and photography. Um, but you also done it in supporting other publishers. You know, if you think about the photo yeah. book review, or if you think about um, even the prize, the award um, that you do with. Uh, so um, maybe can you tell me a bit more about, you know, on, on a personal level, why do you feel? that that's important because you know as you said the western books and other books um i mean they become historical documents but one and, and there is a kind of a tradition we're not going to name publisher but they carry on very strongly that approach to photo book making um i guess the question is why thinking away from that or thinking an alternatively to that yeah, I mean, I, I guess I just was excited by the idea of doing something like this, which was a three part book that Velcroed together and you could spread out to compare these typologies that the photographer Hans Eichelboom had produced um, in Paris, New York and Shanghai. So this idea that the book could perform a different way of viewing work and connecting the work and and even using the work in this case, this is a project that I did with Christian Markley and you might say, well, is this even a book? It's, it's actually, hey, I blurred, I didn't mean to do that. Um, but uh, Christian Markley used this deck of cards with images that he had shot of uh, musical notation in the landscape and then used this to perform a score, an improvisational score where he would take this deck of cards and uh, offer selections to a group of musicians who would then riff and improvise off of these, um, what they had seen in the image. And that to me was just so much more interesting and exciting and a 
an expansion of what the book can do that I felt wasn't being explored. And I saw other people exploring these possibilities and it seemed a shame not to keep growing the the field of bookmaking with such a long legacy in the history of Aperture, not to keep evolving that because, just because. I mean, because it, it seemed evident that it was happening around us. So um, do you want to maybe, uh, you pointed out uh, Jerry Baja, Martin Parr's um, book of books, uh, but what were the other things that changed in the 2000s that um, maybe created a context for changes also aperture? Um, well, I mean, I think fundamentally <laughs> the ability to produce books more affordably that took risks like the ones we're talking about, gatefolds and, you know, um, you know, multiple volumes stuck together, decks of cards, suddenly the globalization of the production economy made it possible for an individual or an organization like Aperture to take a few more risks in producing something unusual. I think that's really the fundamental baseline is the change of technology of reproduction, that the ability to get more faithful reproduction, more consistently over time and to create these new forms and formats was suddenly available. Again, I think the sort of internationalization also of, the, of that moment when the World Wide Web you know, made it possible to sort of peer over your shoulder and see what was happening in Japan. I will say that before I did my internship at Aperture, I had wanted to do the internship when I graduated from school. I knew I couldn't afford to live in New York City because I didn't know anybody and New York is expensive. So I went to Japan to teach English and I fell all the more in love with photography that I saw happening. And um, so that experience, but also suddenly seeing that there was this circulation and exchange of information about books spurred by collections like Martin Parr's, uh, you know, books or 101, the book of 101 books by Andrew Roth, that suddenly people were taking a look and, and also understanding that this is an international photo audience. And that's always been important to me, I think, because... I don't know, the, the US can actually be quite a small, can be very navel gazing in, its, in the work that it appreciates. And I think that there's the more hybridization and cross fertilization that we are able, the more air you inject into your understanding of the photo world, the more interesting it can be. And I, I'm pausing on this one, this Takashi Homa Tokyo book, because it was one of the, after the Eiko Hosoi, it was one of the first books, original books that I had commissioned of a Japanese photographer. And I don't know if you can tell the sort of the reference on the cover. It's very, very subtle, but I will tell you the story that I was very excited about making a Japanese photo book that had lots of bells and whistles, gatefolds, bright colors. And I, we couldn't get this book off the ground. And finally, uh, Takashi Homa showed me two things, a copy of Diane Arbus's monograph and a copy of Borges, some Borges book with deckled edges. And uh, had also, also talked about his love for penguin classics. So you may not think of it, but that cover with the tan top and bottom is a very subtle reference to penguin classics. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, but it's also uh, the size of the book. Isn't it quite small? It's, it's, it's small, it's readerly, it does have deckled edges. And I think that kind of, that kind of cross fertilization to me was also super exciting and something that, um, I don't know, do you think, I, what do you think? I mean, you tell me because this is when you were uh, also. I mean, I think um, what you say is all true. It's also true that it's an interesting triangulation between a change of photography itself. So the photographers and the work they will make 
or they were making, as well as the audience. Of course, all these things work together. So the audience is educated to new possibilities through the literature around the history of photo books and the book fairs, for example, where places people can educate themselves, uh, other possibilities, as well as think the photo a kind of younger generation of photographer came with different expectations, or so maybe less pressure into you know, conforming to a certain format of photo books. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's true, but I think it wasn't even possible for younger photographers to dream of making books without, I mean, as you said, it's the confluence of that, right? Because, yeah, it, and this idea of the limited edition, like that books didn't have to be made for a huge public, because for a long time, publishers mm -hmm. who publish photo books, I, like from the larger publishers like Thames and Hudson or Fiden or Simon and Schuster were aiming for a huge market. And you had to do that in order to get the economy of scale. Once it became possible, right, for, for you or you know anybody who was making small run books, suddenly, um, you know, when Blurb came along or the Indigo Press as a whole, you know, this idea that you could make just one book and be satisfied, I think just um, broke open the floodgates for what was possible. Yeah. I mean, I, um, I think it's interesting because to me, the real shift is what you just described. You know, mm. a, a publisher or a publishing house was kind of set to produce a, these books that had to find an audience and the audience were at least a couple of thousands. And of course, you know, for publishers like uh, um, Aperture, this is still this, the case in the majority of the project. But then it came up a kind of different group of publisher, which expectations were very different. And yeah. now going to, you know, the sub-publisher, but also these hybrid type of publishers. If you think about the designer publishers or the photographer publisher, the publisher couple, of, the expectations about, you know, number of copy to sell and the economy around it uh, really shifted. Partly also because of the, you know, economic turmoil of that period. Um, a lot of, mm, you know, chain of bookstores disappeared and the traditional trade um, and distribution disappeared and never quite recovered. I think there was a perfect storm to open up a uh, new possibility in publishing. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right about that. And I'm looking down right now because I've been actually working on a timeline of the last 10 years for the next issue of the photo book review, which I'm going to uh, try to move my slides to, but my, there we go. You had mentioned that one of the things that I do aside from, <laughs> excuse me, making books for Aperture is I have been very interested in looking at what this boom, this sort of free spirit that you're talking about and that you've been very involved in as the founder of Self Publish Be Happy, which when I first heard that uh, you had started that and that was the title of it, when somebody just said, oh, self-publish, be happy. I was so tickled by the idea that you could you could self-publish and be happy because um, I spend a lot of, it's a lot of pain and agita to be published by somebody else. So what a great idea. But um, yeah, so I've been doing this timeline and, you know, it, it is within the last 20 years that, in 2003, the first commercially available print on demand platforms came available. The first, uh, you know, photo book festival at Castle was founded in 2008. So, you know, only 13 years ago. But the creation of these, the infrastructure for exchange and sharing ideas and promoting uh, the community of the photo book. I think is also super fascinating to me because frankly, as much as I love to make the kinds of books that we were just looking at that have, you know, their cards, their multiple books in one book, they have a million gatefolds. It's frankly just not, it's not right for every book and it's not necessarily what Aperture does. So I wanted to create a space where I could engage with the community who was doing really crazy, fascinating things. And, um, 
and yet still maintain the sort of line of publishing that Aperture has been doing for the last, you know, 52 years. Um, so do you want to, do you want to, um, because I think it's interesting and I'm not an expert about um, Aperture history, so you can correct me on this, but it does feel that there was a moment in which Aperture uh, of course, there, there was an exhibition space, the education program, so maybe came out of that, but became a sort of organization that will support the publishing world and not just a kind of pure publisher. And in the form of the uh, awards, uh, the photo book review, and just generally kind of attention to this other world that was happening around it. Um, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that's the moment that we're talking about really happens in 2011. And that came with uh, the first issue of the photo book review was published in 2011. I should say that the publish the photo book review for those of you who don't know it, because it's kind of hard to come by. It's available at Perry Photo. It's been available to subscribers of Aperture Magazine in the US, periodically also abroad. But it was this idea that there, there were other experts like you, Bruno, who guest edited one issue, or uh, Federica Chiochetti, who um, wanted to do a deep dive into the idea of text in the photo book, that there, there needed to be a space for the development, not just of like, hey, look at this cool book, hey, look at that cool book, but a discourse around this evolving and and growing art form, you know? So the, the photo book review was created in a way to serve as the catalog for the Perry Photo Aperture Foundation Photo Book Awards, but it became something more than that too, in that it published twice a year and in the fall, it always serves as a catalog for the photo book review or photo book awards, which I should say were just announced and there's a great roster of the shortlist for those of you who are interested in sort of the most uh what five people in the world consider uh 35 books that need further attention it's not comprehensive by any means uh, but it is a way of just trying to ascertain what are people doing in each of the different types of publishing that are available to people today um but in general the the photo book awards are also a way of pointing attention. We, Aperture isn't allowed to enter any of the books. Our co-publishers um, like Del Pier and Co are not allowed to enter the awards because we really want to talk about sort of what's happening in the world outside of ourselves. And that's because we're, we're able to do that as a not-for-profit. But I think in a way, this does come from something I felt deeply because it's very hard to make an argument to people. Why is Aperture a not-for-profit? Well, you make books, you sell books. We all know that bookmaking is a not profitable venture, but that's different from being a not-for-profit. And this to me seems like a way of creating more of uh, uh, an acknowledgement and a support system for other publishers working in the field. Mm. Um so to me, I think you've been very instrumental in um, creating this kind of discourse around photo books with you know, a bunch of other people. Um, and I think that has been, a, uh, to me, that is equally as important as your job as a publisher, because in a way, you know, all these initiatives actually nurture the, the um, not, not only the community, but also the language, the transformation of the language. You know, if, if you think about the photo book review, it took kind of some important issue, race, uh, you know, feminism and photography. And ex so it's been really sometimes a kind of catalyst of work around that theme, but also, and this is where I think it's equally important has been also a place where people have been encouraged to think differently about the possibility of photography and the photo book. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I hope so. Thank you for saying that. And I do, of course, owe a debt of gratitude to people like 
Julian Friedman, who was at the time the head of Perry Photo, who invited both Chris Boot, the director of Aperture, and I to think about what kind of prize and community building exercise could Perry Photo engage with to also extend its footprint as something more than just a fair and frankly, a great place for the community to gather. Um, so, and, you know, as I mentioned for the photo book review, there have been 18 guest editors. I think that as an editor, what I learn is that, and as a bookmaker, you know, it's not a solitary undertaking. It really is collaborative. And I've found that this discourse and the dialogue that we're talking about has been so critical in general. I mean, I think when you have off print, when you have uh, the New York Art Book Fair and you're able to run around and talk to individuals standing at their table and ask them questions and talk about the books that they've been producing. I mean, I think, I can't remember how we met Bruno, but maybe at Portfolio Review at Rhubarb Rhubarb or something, but surely, Shortly thereafter, it was in Paris or at one of these New York, probably the New York Photo New Festival York. and the New York Art Book Fair, right? So, and again, this sort of ability to connect across borders to me, which is something that photography has always offered in and of itself. Like, why am I not in the other art fields? Because I appreciate the connection to the outside world. And frankly, the outside world is a lot more than my backyard. So, um, um, yeah. I'm I have a couple of other questions because we need to stop in 10 minutes uh, okay. to the questions. Um, I, I wanted to know within all these kind of changes, um, mm -hmm. how do you feel you change as one, a publisher? So somebody that um, think about a list and not just a publication. Um, I know that your role has shifted and changed, but you know, you're thinking holistically about what book to publish. Um, but also, how do you feel your change as an editor? So the person that actually make the book? Um, it's a really good question. And I think, you know, I have a publisher. How mm -hmm. is different? Let's start as a publisher. How's uh, uh, the, today's list of aperture different from, let's not talk about, you know, 1990s, but, you know, the, the early 2000s? Well, I mean, I, I think all of these factors that we've been talking about and a sort of loosening up of the idea of what a book can be has been really important. And also, you know, I, I do, I will say that one of the things that if you track the history of Aperture, it's always responsive to what's happening in the world of photography, whether it's, you know, the shift from black and white to color or, um, you know, name it what you will, not that it's chasing trends, but it's reflecting the needs and the interests of the community. At least that's the narrative we believe in. So things like, and I, I popped over to this slide, which is uh, Daito Moriyama's TKY, which was a collaborative bookmaking experience where Daito Moriyama selected um, a series of images that were folded as gatefolds. We printed them out on a photocopier. The, each of the options of these pages were put on the wall and people came into the space and could select, oh, I want that image, I want that image. And so thinking about the act of editing in a really on the ground dynamic way, um, how this impacted my approach to editing images, I'm not entirely sure, but I will say like just this idea that you can, you know, I'm always interested in building an understanding around how images work together to create meaning and how the context around those things creates help to either hinder or advance that meaning. So when you give people the tools and the ability to think about like, oh my gosh, I can make these choices. I can edit these things, which is sort of endemic to the, to the self-publishing world too. I think it, it just, it heightens a level of visual literacy and of literacy around the book and 
I want people to understand more about how you read images and and that sort of ecosystem of the image on the printed page. So I do think that if you look through my output as a an editor and the choices I make, I'm often gravitating towards things that underscore or unpack how images arrive in front of your eyes, how they circulate, how they've been put together by somebody who edited them. For example, this is a project that I did with Kathy Ryan, who's the amazing um, editor of the New York Times Magazine, photo editor. And you know her ability to select the right photographer and the right author and to go out into the field or into the studio and bring back something that helps us learn more about the world that's super fascinating to me and that's the type of project that i i care about um but i'm also interested in these sort of more experimental things and i'm also interested in projects that sort of point out how photography and again the way it it makes meaning is shifting. So something like this, which is Penelope Umbrico's um, photography, which is about as far away from the classic aperture school in a way she's working with images that she sources online from places like Flickr or just the internet writ large. And um, this is, I did her first monograph and then I asked her to participate in a project that was called Aperture Remix. And it was in celebration of Aperture's 60th anniversary. And I wanted to select photographers who could comment on Aperture's past. This is just another picture of it where the photographer in question selected a book that Aperture had published in the past and then responded to it as an artist. So. Penelope Umbrico chose the master series, the master of photography. And she created this project that you can see in the installation there where she photographed all of the mountains in the masters of photography, Cartier-Bresson's mountains, um, you know, uh, Lartigue's mountains, if there were any Lartigue's, Weston's mountains, you name it. And then ran them through photo filters. So they became manipulated and about unstable of an image, as you can imagine, and then created this amazing Leporello fold book. I mean, this sound, starts to get very esoteric, but I'm always interested in these kinds of ideas that are really at the heart of it, maybe about the world, but also the image in the world and how we use them. Does that make sense? Do, do, you, do you think that uh, if one will recognize your hands in the books that you made, of course, you know, with a catalog of 100 books, there's books that you had to do because of all sorts of different reasons. So, but at the core of your practice as an editor, do you think there is an interest in photography as the medium that reflects the world that we live in, literally, you know, a kind of mirror to the world that we're in? Um, because it seems a lot of the things that you're interested in, both as an editor and um, as a curator or, pro or somebody that's been programming, it's to think about, in a way, the function of photography. Yeah, I think the function of photography and the function of the book as a vehicle for photography, this is a great example that you and I worked on together. A classic, so this is a classic. Yes, classic, beautiful, look how bright and poppy. Um, you're looking at books, you're looking at how books operate. Um, so I do think that that's a really important, it's, I love thinking about how we use photography. And so even something like Martin Parr's Life's a Beach where the first limited edition, and again, taking the lessons I learned from Kamaitachi that, and that were happening in the field around me, that you could take something like uh, Martin Parr's beach pictures and create something that felt like a family album. And then we published it later. I mean, it came first as, a, as an album and then later as a little pocket size, beach bag size edition. Like, again, the reference to something, how we use images to me is super important. 
On the other hand, I also love a project like Latoya Ruby Frazier, which is very classic narrative and images, but in this case really tells us something about the world that we need to know. Same with the project like the Sochi Project, an atlas of war and tourism in the Caucasus. So I think those two um, poles are sort of what I bounce between in thinking about books and bookmaking. Um, um, we have a few minutes left yeah. and I have a, um, maybe the last question. Okay. Um, you know, thinking about what, you know, I think you've been, I mean, for this um, occasion, you've been thinking about your 25 years careers, but generally with a photo book, you've been thinking about what's happened, what happened the last 10 years. Um, you seem kind of quite uh, focused in thinking about a kind of arc. And I wonder if you have a sense of where are we now? I mean, I'm not going to ask, and maybe the audience will, about the future of the photo book, um, but I, I'm, I'm finding quite difficult to even know where, where we are now. And I think both as somebody that loves book, purchase book, you went through, I don't know how many hundreds book for the photo book review, uh, for the photo book prize, um, and somebody that's thinking about publishing books in the next couple of years. Where are we? Oh. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know, but I will say that, um, you know, I think the audience were in the midst of another shift of, um, or maybe it's just an acknowledging about who the, who the audiences can be and who the makers of photography are. Um, oh, the stories. And, and yeah, exactly, expanding the network of stories. Even the New Black Vanguard, though, if you if we're talking about sort of these are images that appear first in fashion magazines and fashion has always been on the cusp of sort of what's allowable in fine art photography. And, you know, for one reason or another, fashion has responded more readily than the gallery world to artists of color. So putting together something like this that I have to say was incredibly moving to see how hungry of an audience there was for seeing themselves, seeing the work of other artists of color reflected on the pages, um, in physical spaces like at Arl this past summer. I think something there is very important to the future. That's that's sort of the the most I think I can say because, you know, we have a world where tomorrow Christie's is auctioning off the first NFT, right, and uh, of photography specifically within the photo field. So the first, I mean, they've done other NFTs, but like, what is that going to do to the world of photography? Does it have any bearing on the book? Maybe not. But I think again. And as you said, like that moment in 2008, 2009, 2010, where there was an economic, um, you know, convulsion and there were all of these declarations that print is dead and photography is dead because of the advent of the digital. We're in another moment like that, where I think, you know, in that moment, I, you put your ear to the ground and see what, um, what is happening and, and what that's what a good editor does, I think, is kind of have your your tentacles out to see what's what's in the wind, right? What do you think, Bruno? What's the future? No, but um, this was meant to be your end. <laughs> that yeah. were questions. Okay, more questions. <laughs> let's, let's open it up for more questions then. Um, but I mean I briefly I do think that this is if, if the other kind of earthquake was caused by technology, partly finance, as often does, um, I think this earthquake comes from a different place and is a, a kind of much more political and social changes. Um, mm. And that shift has to be reflected in mm. the photo book community, mm. in photography, like anywhere else. And photo books are very slow to respond to this. And in fact, the book that you done was a book that responded to fashion, which is much more readily, as you said, to respond because it's editorial. So, you know, there's, there's a short amount of time given to produce work. 
I do think, I do hope, not as much as maybe Perry Photo this year, but I do hope that the New York Book Fair in LA in, in the next spring or it, it will be, it will look different. People selling the book will look different. The makers of the book will look different. And maybe you and I were going to be redundant. We got our medal and we just fuck off. Exactly. I'm taking my medal and I'm going home. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I invite the audience to ask questions, more interesting questions than mine. Thanks so much, uh, Leslie and Bruno. That was fantastic. And um, there's some really hanging questions there just waiting to be answered. We've got some coming in from our audience and I'll, I'll come to, in fact, I'll take the, the first public question and then some will come directly into me, which I'll follow up with. But Stuart Wall um, is asking, firstly, he's saying a really interesting discussion about the world of photo books, so thank you. Um, he was wondering what audience Leslie finds engaged with the Aperture catalogue of photo books and publications and exhibitions. Thank you. Um, it's a really interesting question because in fact, um, we, we think a lot about audience and we chart a path along a multiplicity of audiences. Um, Aperture is not a single, uh, you know, it doesn't bear any individual's name who has a direct imprint on the way, well, imprint on the imprint, the way things look, the selection of books. I mean, I think the range of titles that we've produced over the years sort of showcase a pretty wide range of types of photography. Um, we have very wide taste in what gets represented. And we've also expanded into places like the, you know, children's books and sort of more for, um, entry level, let's say, or prosumers who want to be uh, introduced to the thinking of artists and in, in things like the workshop series. So uh, what I really appreciate about Aperture, in fact, is that there are multiple audiences. What I've been describing is sort of the output of books that I'm, I'm responsible for and thinking about, <clears throat> but I'm not the only editor at Aperture. So my colleague Denise Wolf has really spearheaded that sort of more populist children's book oriented workshop book ser uh, series oriented. And she's really excellent at being able to find that audience. Um, I'm interested in the discourse around the photo book and how you can sort of stretch and bend that as well as, you know, produce um a book that gives voice to an individual artist. So um, there's other editors from the magazine who also contribute books, but I don't know if this answers your question, but we do, yeah, there are, there's, there's different audiences and I'll just show two other slides because I think you can look at two books like this, which are both produced by Aperture, both produced by me, one was Richard Mizrax on the beach, which was produced for a collector's audience, also gave room for the scale of this artist's work who produces things quite large. And Zalmai, who's a photojournalist from Afghanistan, um, who was recording in, in 2007, 2008, the refugee crisis, which led to so much unrest in the Middle East. But you can see this is sort of reflecting the scale. You don't make a giant book when you're trying to, a beautiful, lavish book for that collectors will buy when you want to communicate to audiences who care about something like a refugee crisis. So that's a long answer, but I hope it makes sense. It does. I think Stuart's acknowledged that. So thank you for that. Um, and that sort of picks up for another question that's come in directly. Uh, you mentioned the, the Edward, Edward Weston book that's still in print. And again, it's sort of following on from Stuart's question. Do you, do you have a sense of who that audience is buying that? Is it is it students? Is it broader than just the sort of student, the photo student community? Yeah, I think it's it's a classics audience, you know, people who are just maybe learning about the field of fine art photography have been learning about, you know, photography, maybe even on Instagram or something like that. And they suddenly realize this, there's this whole other school of uh, creating images that are 
still and meditative and, um, you know, have a different uh, impetus in their creation. But I will say, and I, this is a slide uh, that is also part of that remix project. You wouldn't necessarily know that Vivian Sassen, who's a very contemporary artist, for example, is someone who found inspiration in Edward Weston's work as a student. And this is a, this is a project where you can see uh, Vivian has selected images and inserted them into a classic Western book to talk about abstraction and the body. Um, so you never know who, you know, you think, okay, that's a classic audience, but you never really know who is doing what you just have a sense of like, okay, if it's, if it's this kind of audience, it might need this kind of a form. But we hope, of course, that every book finds a more expansive audience than you even think. Can I just uh, do a follow up on this? What are the books that are regularly printed, reprinted? Well, I think we would go back to that slide of our classics. I mean, the certainly the Weston. Um, I was just on press in July. It seems fantastical, but I was overseeing the printing of the Arbus 50th anniversary. It's been in print for 50 years as of 2022, uh, fall of 2022. The Nan Golden is now in its 21st printing. Um, Uncommon Places, that's the first edition that you see, but that continues to live on in its more contemporary version, uh, Sally Mann, uh, we've just reprinted a different, but we've just worked with the National Gallery of Art to do a new Robert Adams. I mean, it is sometimes those classics, but something like um, the new Black Vanguard is now in its fourth printing since 2019. So, um, you know, we're always trying, the backlist is very important. We're always trying to feed the backlist. Um, a book like Zanelli Moholy's now is in its fourth printing as well, also has a French edition and an Italian edition. So yeah, it's, it's kind of fascinating to see the lives these books take on once you, you know, if, if they, I hope, represent the artist's intention. Um, we've got another question here, which in fact, I'm, I'm going to ask both Bruno and Leslie to respond to, because I think it's quite interesting. Um, and the, the, our question is asking, has the growth of smaller publishers and more specialist publishers impacted how you at Aperture approach publishing, uh, or have they simply grown the market for photo books? Have they grown the market for photo books is a really interesting question. Um, and I think everyone would love to know the answer to that. I, ha I am inspired by the community that I think Aperture is just one piece of. And that's, again, why I, I love, have loved the photo book review. Um, I will say that we are bringing the photo book review to an end. It's 10 years now. We're folding it into the magazine. But it's been such a source of connection and inspiration. So I, I'm looking forward to the continuation of that effort in a different form. Um, Bruno, what would you say? Um, I do think that um, definitely small publishers and some publisher have pushed the language, um, sometimes to places undesirable yeah. places, but then you have to go really far to get to somewhere that is um, interesting. So I would definitely think that the language has changed because of this, because people really try things. I mean, sometimes you can only get to an interesting place if we try an error um, or push it too far, or I don't know, experiment it with materials, et cetera, et cetera. A traditional publisher cannot do that or can do that only in, you know, uh, uh, can do that only in a small, um, uh, limited um, because of the kind of infrastructure, the kind of commercial infrastructure. Um, so I definitely think that that has been the case. Um, as for how that impacted the market, I, yeah, I don't think I have a good answer to that. 
I will say that I, one of the things I love about the Photo Book Awards is that this year, 836 titles come to me and to the colleagues that help um, adjudicate the awards. You could not have a better way of getting a sense of what people are trying, what's working, what's not working. It's kind of an amazing um, fount of inspiration. And I, I hope that even the short list that we produce is too for the community as it as it tours around. Yeah, I saw the short list earlier this week and it's fantastic. So I certainly would encourage anyone to to check it out on the, the Aperture website. It really is a inspiring and an exciting list of, of titles. So it'd be interesting to see how that pans out at Parry Photo. Um, we've got two final questions, I think, now, because we're just starting to run out of time. So I'm going to take Richard's question from the, the public chat. And Richard's asking, uh, Leslie, how do you manage submissions or engage with new authors? Uh, it's hugely uh, a question. I mean, we have a number of conduits, the foremost of which is the, the portfolio prize. Um, it became apparent to us many years ago that it was very frustrating for people to just drop off projects and there was never, never an outcome. And frankly, we can't respond to individual inquiries on that level, but the portfolio prize with work comes through there. And this is a call for entry that's online. Um, it happens once a year. We also do a summer open and it is a vehicle for us to see work that is being developed, uh, work. Some, there are some people who have been submitting for years on end and you see the evolution of a project. Um, you know, we have a sort of editor driven acquisition process rather than um, a reactive uh, acquisition process in that the editors are scouts and they're scouting for um, interesting projects through portfolio reviews, through our own review, um, even looking at the books, you know, books that can are maybe developing a project and have been self published can emerge down the road as something that we might be interested in. So I do recommend when people are asking like, how do I find a publisher? The best thing to do is to start engaging with the community, start going to the book fairs, start looking at who's publishing. If you were always picking up books and saying, gosh, I really love this book, who published it or who designed it? Those types of questions, I think really fine tuning your uh, literacy and how conversant you can be about the book community will better your chances. I don't know, Bruno, did you have a, a response about? Um, I mean, um, generally because the list is very small, um, I tend to work with people I've already engaged in conversations. So, so I see the work of a student at the Royal College. I like, you know, I'm just thinking about Felicity Hammond, British art, um, artist photographer. I saw a graduate graduation show. I invited her to do a workshop for me. And we, we started a conversation that went on and on for years. And then it materialized. And, you know, former students, et cetera, et cetera. So often, I don't respond directly to an existing project. I respond to somebody's practice. So that's the way. But also um, because I relocated to Milan, I'm gonna start a camera club um, because I'm so tired of, of course, this has been wonderful, but I'm tired to be online on Zoom. <laughs> so I'm starting a camera club where people can just come in. Um, and it's maybe it responds to my desire to feel connected to a place and um, having real co life conversation with people, drinking wine. Um, and I don't know if I will go in becoming anything, you know, or a book or anything. Um, but... Um, that kind of content interaction is to me very important sometimes even more than just a set of pictures that are brilliant i mean a brilliant set of pictures might not make a great book um, an interesting mind behind the work uh, often does not always often it's great and then i think our final question this evening then is a nice open-ended one i think again I'd, I'd ask you both to respond to it perhaps leslie first um, how do you see the future of book publishing? I sense you are optimistic. Is that the case? 
<sighs> you know, I, I wouldn't have been stayed at Aperture for as long as I have if I weren't a diehard optimism that a better day is just around the corner. <laughs> um, no, I think I think that the book as a vehicle for a photographer's work as a platform is something that's going to have a sustained role in the photo community. Um, what that role is, how we engage with it, um, it's very, very unclear, but I'm, I'm optimistic to reconnect with the photo community out there in the world through book fairs and photo fairs with books. So yeah, I guess I'm, I'm optimistic. We're still here. And I will say that, you know, the weird thing about the pandemic is that um, people found solace in books and books could travel when we could not. And I think people have really um, found that to be inspiring so i'm inspired bruno i'm always positive i don't look positive but i'm feeling <laughs> very positive good and that's the perfect note i think to to bring this evening to a conclusion so leslie thank you so much for, for sharing some of your experiences and knowledge with us this evening and bruno thank you also for sharing yours and for drawing out some of that from from leslie as well it's it's been a fantastic evening and um we've i think our audience has been really engaged with it i said i certainly have so thank you both again for that and congratulations on your medals so well deserved of course yeah. and um we look forward to welcoming our audience back for future talks in this series which will be circulating so thank you finally to joe mcdonald who organized this evening thank you joe for doing that thank you leslie thank you bruno and thank you so much to our audience for joining us good night everyone bye all right thank you